we have so many more things that we want to share with you than we have time for tonight. So do keep your eyes peeled. We're, we're in conversation with Nicole about having an in-person workshop where we can actually um, execute some of the strategies uh, at, at somebody's home and really right. demonstrate how things are done and the nuances of working with life to yeah. create a fire safe landscape. Right. So as we all know, right, we've just been wrecked you know, racked with fires and wildfires in North America. Um, this last year in 2020, over 10 million acres burned in wildfires in North America and 4.4 million acres alone in California. So California alone made up almost half of the wildfires in all of North America last year, which was, you know, and then in 2019, <clears throat> the total was 4.7. So we really, mm -hmm more than doubled and California basically did what we all yeah. did in a year in 2019. So it's so great to have so much interest in this, um, in this offering. Mm -hmm. um, we're really excited to also hear from all of you and what questions you have. We are gonna, um, yeah, we wanna really just presence. Um, so the lens that we're coming at this with is the permaculture lens or regenerative, we like to say regenerative disturbances or regenerative mm -hmm. engagement with, with the land. And you can do this on any level, on, on a home scale, or you, if you have a small home, and if, even if you're renting or if you have acreage and you just wanna make yourself more um, fire safe, fire aware, there's mm -hmm. so many things that we can do. So the permaculture lens, you wanna just, we're just gonna talk about that just for mm -hmm. a moment. You know, as Nicole said, we taught the first PDC, Woohoo! This Yay. is the beginning of this year in Benicia, and some we of our see graduates some of our are here on the call. Favorite people, yes, hello. Um, on the call, we're so thrilled that you're all here, and we're continuing to to be and work together. Mm -hmm. um, so the permaculture lens is really it's so helpful in these times where we're really trying to figure out what is the best way to respond rather than to react yeah. to climate change in ways that can really. Um, create beautifully, aesthetically pleasing, lush landscapes mm -hmm. that are also really supporting us mm -hmm. in um, decreasing our risk of fire and decreasing our risk of fire spreading in and around mm -hmm. our homes. I mean, that's really what this is. Can we say that something's fireproof? No. 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 So we're just going to go right out right. <laughs> and say that. Right. And we do know, and we've read so much research, we do know some strategies that are going to be very helpful in, in mm -hmm. at least reducing risk or enhancing your likelihood of coming through better off yeah. <laughs> in the event of a fire, which really we um, have to hold strong visions for yeah. best possible outcomes for this for this year. And so the, the permaculture approach is really um, figuring out how to how to solve our problems within this holistic model of being within nature and using life to solve our solve the problems, like using life to um, be the the key pivotal piece of the strategy that is keeping us, you know, getting us moving us more forward as members of an ecosystem, so that we're fire safer and we're also um, still working with the landscape and providing homes for animals and, uh, you know, respecting the ecology of the area. So it's we actually area. have a slideshow. Should I put the slideshow yeah, up now? The slide and then it doesn't have to just yeah. put our faces, right? So here we go. Just give me a sec. Um, so this using life to solve um, the problems here is really the, the crux of the lush landscape. And so um, we're going to keep coming back to that theme and um, the theme of life through water. Theme of, yes, through water. Yeah. So there are some principles. So our whole, whole thing around uh, permaculture, if you're interested, is there are sets. There's multiple different types of sets of guiding principles for permaculture and the ones we're going to engage with a lot today are observation mm -hmm. um, which is just really looking around so if you've experienced <laughs> a fire in your area to act, you know look at aerial maps yeah. look at the roads which ways did the fire come from how did different um, what burned what, what didn't burned burn. what didn't burn and that's so interesting sometimes right because yeah. at least and remember like we've looked at a lot of aerial photographs of places that have burned and there's actually <clears throat> some greenery around the houses know, that surprising. are burned to the ground and so we're going to talk a little bit about like well how is that even possible um so observation is one um using on-site resources mm -hmm. right all of your resources that are on site, yes, some things will be, have to be thinned, but what are you going to do with them then? Right. Yeah. And what other resources might you have on site that 
so many people sort of shunt away that is absolutely golden exactly. for us right now. We're going to give you one guess, but you don't have yeah. to answer now. You might right. know what it is. And, <laughs> and hand in hand with those on-site resources is the biological resources. Yes. Like what are the living elements that can do the job instead of maybe a concrete or a, a hardscaping solution? Right. And another idea is this idea in permaculture that it's so beautiful is that you have elements mm -hmm. in a landscape those are your nouns. Mm -hmm. Those are your structures. Those are your, you know, that's your compost pile or your chicken coop mm -hmm. or whatever. And then you want to make sure that each of those is supported by many um, functions, functions, which are your adjectives. Your or, verbs. Or your verbs. Yeah, Sorry, your verbs. that's what I meant. Your, with your, yes, your yes. verbs. Sorry. So your elements are supporting <laughs> your, your nouns are supporting your verbs. So the function of having fire safety is supported by this whole series of redundancies that we're going to take you through. Coming yeah. up now. Right now. So yes. here we go. Oh, so, and just so you know, at the end, there will be 15 minutes for Q&A unless we wrap up a little early. Mm -hmm. um, you can put some things in the chat, but sometimes the chat can get really busy. So yeah. if you wouldn't mind writing them down and then just typing them in right away. Yeah. And that would be really be, helpful. And it if can there's be hard to track the chat when we're in the right. slideshow. And if there's a clarifying question along the way, put it in and hopefully Nicole or Allison would see it and be able to just let us know. So feel free yeah. to do that, the two of you, if yeah. that works. Just a, a word on this photo here though, just notice the, the burnt landscape behind and then all of this lush greenery around somebody's gardens. And here's a pond. And yeah, and this pond. And yeah. a lot of um, deciduous like food producing looking plants going on here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. There we, there we go. So before we started, we wanted to just share these. So we have so many resources. So these three um, links, their live links, will send you the PDF and you can click on them. And um, so basically, there are so many agencies out there working to provide all of us, um, whether we're living in urban areas or wilderness, what is it, wildland, urban, urban interfaces, interfaces uh, <laughs> WUIs, um, with with not only recommendations, but also laws and what yeah. we really have to do depending on where we live. So we're not going to go through all of, we're going to really focus on the yeah. using life for life and for fire prevention from that. Um, but we also from the have read lens. all of these yeah. publications and are very well aware and really want to provide you all with resources and strategies that you can use within what is considered safe and mm -hmm. fire wise mm -hmm. and fire safe by CAL FIRE and your yeah. local RCD, even PG&E. Right. Um, PG&E might go a little bit further in a direction than we would go. Right. And if that's what makes you feel safer, right. you know. And there it, are it, some, yeah, there are some gray areas around like what's recommended, what's not recommended, because as Anne mentioned, like there's no fireproof. There's less flammable and more flammable and um, you know, doing everything you reasonably can. And then understanding that there are certain types of fires where nothing survives. It doesn't matter if you, you know, had concrete for the whole hundred feet of defensible space around your home, that yeah. everything will burn. So, um, but what we are going to do, so all, what all three of these resources have in common are these three zones. Yeah. And so in permaculture, you know, permaculture, not only are we working with rather than against nature, but the idea of permaculture is it's a design science. And so what, what we're really wanting also to offer is that all of you get to become designers yeah. of your own homes and landscapes using some principles and the strategies we're going to talk about today. So zones we completely use and zones yeah. in the permaculture sense. So you'll see zones, this is zone zero, the zero to five feet. Non-combustible. Non, um, and then zone one is five to 30 feet. Clean, green, and lean. Yeah, notice the lean, clean, and, and green. green. We are very mm -hmm. happy because sometimes we see that and it just says lean, lean and, and clean, clean. Mm -hmm. but the green is so critical. Yeah. So um, Cal Fire has the green in there. We want you all, when you yeah. hear it, Make sure people are adding the green in there just the to green. remind them, yep. okay? Um, and so the last one is the 30 to 100 feet and that's zone two. So that's here's- just fuel reduction zone. Fuel so reduction can... zone. And so here's the deal. If you're in a woodland, okay, wild, what is it? Wildland, wildland urban, urban interface. Thank you. <laughs> UWI, -W -W check it out. There's no standard definition for this. Yeah. So it depends on where you live and what your own county and or city or area is going to do. But in most cases, if you live in some place that has been defined as a WUI, you have to have the um, zones two, one and two. 
So the yeah. up to 30 feet and the 30 to 100 feet yeah. to keep your property safe. Yeah. Um, the zone zero is rather newer and it's not required by law, but but it absolutely actually makes a lot of sense. It's that, you know, closest in zone. Yeah. And actually the Cal Fire actually says that the zone zero is the most important of all yeah. of the defensible spaces. And yeah. so we will go into that some. Yeah. But we want to give you this to start. Yeah. So there's some concepts we want to um, get alive in your consciousness as we're moving through here. And, um, <laughs> so this is, you know, in the, in the interest of turning us all into people who can design our landscapes for fire safety, um, it's important to know dry soil does not hold water and it can barely absorb any water. Like it just, everything runs off for a really long time before the soil begins to be able to hold any water in the fall. Right. So if we can do something to keep the water from ever totally drying out, it's, it's so beneficial on so many, it's so, so many levels, right? Then we absorb the rain as soon as it comes, then we have that moisture in there for the plants. Right. So we want you know, so we're designing with fire in mind. So we're going to be thinking of water right? all the time. And if we're thinking of water, and as Lydia just said, the dry soil doesn't hold water. So how can we fix this? Right. And so part of it is understanding this idea of the soil carbon sponge, which we'll talk about later. But the, basically, mm -hmm. the soil carbon sponge is like taking flat, what people like to call dirt, which is kind of dusty. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look very it's alive. Fine. It's super fine and it blows around in the wind, it's right? Like no pore spaces or clumps or anything. It's just There's no moisture. Dusty. There's no critters. You know, I think Dee Dee per Persaus or Elaine Ingham says that there are herds of, of underground, underground microbes, microbes that, sh that would be there. Just, in live soil. In, in live, live soil. soil. So adding yeah. water. So we're really wanting to create um, a really good soil carbon sponge. Um, and the soil carbon sponge comes into being when you have water and you have some organic matter and plants. Then those microbes come. So the microbes make the pore space and hold the particles together and make it totally a different texture. It actually fluffs up and, becomes and the temperature spongy, goes down and the right? roots can penetrate and it just has a whole different feel and smell and um, action. Yeah. So we'll go into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of our questions was, does my you know, if, if I'm really wanting to be fire wise and fire smart, does everything have to be hardscaped and bare? And so we're just to put out that the dry bare soil and hardscaping, they're pretty is, equivalent. They're pretty equivalent. And, and um, so the answer is, um, no, it doesn't have to all be that. Yes, follow what your local authorities say mm -hmm. you must and have to do by law and know that as a designer, you can bring beautiful, aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. um, life also yeah. into these same spaces. And so the dry bare soil and the hardscaping, they create heat. And we're going to show you some maps in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, what we're wanting to do for when there's heat on the ground, the fire, fire can start sooner. And if you mm -hmm, look at this mm -hmm. graph that we just put down over here, this is really simplistic. So the one here to the left is, is drain land. There's no dry water. Dry soil. Dry soil. Okay, so what noticing this heat flux, 70 to 80%, this is how much of the sun's radiation when it hits the ground. And this isn't even concrete. This is just dry, dead soil. This is dry, dead soil, not with water. The heat flux is 70 to 80%, which means that yeah. the heat that gets put into the ground 70 to 80 percent is released into the atmosphere yeah. making your microclimate really hot or yes really hot compared to and then the water vapor it's like 10 to 20 percent so basically there's, there's no water there there's no water there and the heat's just going right back so it's yeah. like this huge oh <laughs> just like that just like <laughs> that, that right yeah notice now so mm. it feels really hot is the short it thing. feels, it feels hot, really hot and it actually does um it can impact the temperature in your is, environment yeah. and around your home. And you, you, we wanted to actually bring the temperatures down. Yeah. And as we all know, rising hot air, it creates a vacuum and that's drawing other air in. So we, we actually begin to create wind and create these thermal uplift, uplifts when we allow surfaces to get so hot. Right. So then we just want to show you to the, and again, so you're thinking of your own landscapes right now. So think now the one on to the right is landscape saturated with water. So not wasteful water. No. We're going to talk about all kinds of ways to saturate mm -hmm. your land and your soil with water and your plants. A moist soil sponge. But notice the huge difference. The heat flux here is five to 10%. That means that the energy that's being given from the sun into the ground, right, is not just boom, boomeranging back is mm -hmm, hot mm -hmm. energy. It's being absorbed more and our water vapor is now up to 80 to 90%. Yeah. So we're actually not only cooling down our space um, 
with the air, but with the moisture. Yeah, that actually that, that, that water that's changing phase from liquid into vapor is actually using that heat for the phase change and taking it away. So yeah. we don't experience that heat. As as the intense heat is you do yeah. here on the left. Yeah. Okay. So these are just some okay. basic principles. And you know, it'll if you have any questions later, it'll all fit into what we're yeah. about to do. We just want to yeah. So the, the the other side, the flip side of all of that is that vegetated moist landscapes maintain cool temperatures and stabilize climate. There's moisture in the soil that the plants can use, and then the plants are actually helping hold the moisture in the soil by dropping their leaves and having their mulch and their roots are participating and feeding the microbes and the microbes have moisture in their bodies and the whole thing is just like a lot of trading of water around instead mm -hmm. of any kind of big loss and drying out. There's just like water being cycled and cycled and cycled. Right. And I'd like to use some time, I mean, my neighbors are great, um, but honestly, so I live, I'm lucky to live on a quarter acre pretty much in town in Santa Cruz and it's almost all vegetation pretty much. And then there's swales and berms, which we'll talk about in a moment. So there's a lot of water catchment of rainwater. Um, there is some downspout, but everything is very lush. There's deciduous trees, there's fruit trees. Um, the temperature in my backyard on the same day, because mm -hmm. actually it was 98 degrees in my backyard and I literally had to walk around to go talk to the gal next door. She's all paved. It's all paved. It's all concrete. There's no trees. It's rocks mm -hmm. with some bushes. And you go over there and it's like, so much oh, hotter. It's so much hotter. Yeah. And it's so much drier. And she's yeah. literally my neighbor. Yeah. And this is not just about shade. Like that's a really important yeah. thing. This is not just about shade. It's about the capacity of the moist earth to be evaporating and for the plants to be using that water and transpiring, like exhaling that moisture out of their leaves. Right. So great. And so this is the, our favorite one right here. And this is, it seems like a no brainer, but this is also in all of the lovely, most of the lovely publications that they we've seen. Mention, yes. They don't mention that we wanna really keep on-site water on site. Right. Yeah. Not drain it so away. So water send falls it into from the, the sky. River. Capture yeah. it. Keep it on. And we're going to talk about exactly how you can do that. You yeah. like to take baths. You like to take showers. I do. <laughs> What's a really easy way to keep your, that's called gray water mm -hmm. on your site to keep your lush landscapes lush all year. Yeah. And you're not having to spend more money on irrigation yeah. or on water. Yeah. You're having to spend a little bit of time figuring it out. Or we have people up in your area we can refer you to or as yeah. a who can come and help you install it quite easily. And yeah. again, we'll talk about those. So super yeah. important. We want to keep all of our on-site water on site. We don't want to shunt it out into the drains yeah. for so many reasons. And with the gray water, even if you have a septic system, and so technically that water is staying on site and it's doing good, it's infiltrating and there are trees accessing it. But if you could distribute that water, the non-toilet portion of that water, if you could distribute it more widely on the surface or just subsurface, then you can support way more plants and have a much more moist and cooled landscape. Awesome. So then the other, these are our last just basic considerations that all plants can burn. Like we said, fire resistant, not fireproof. <coughs> Excuse me. And then clean, green, and lean. Those are just some basic, like we're yeah. going gonna to wrap it all in. Yeah. So, um, and right. you know, Cal Fire, I'm just going to say, we are loving the Cal Fire's resources. They're really, yeah. really balanced and really, really good. And the RCD yeah. has great. So yeah, the, the actual recommendations out there are pretty reasonable, but there are there are people who are getting scared and kind of going above and beyond. And so we really want to develop this culture of, of green and life and moisture <clears throat> as opposed to um, the clearing. Right. So then we just wanted to quickly talk about weather um, patterns, um, weather elements that affect fire behavior. We're not going to go into these in great detail, but um, temperature, I'm just going to list them. So temperature, wind. Right, so that seems we just talked about temperature and wind and and wind. So bit. stability of the atmosphere, which we're not going to go into so great, and then relative humidity. Yeah. But or and <laughs> the strategies we're going to talk about tonight can help to enhance or mitigate depending on where you live and what mm -hmm. your situation is. All of these. All of effects. these weather effects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just to drive the point home about temperature, if you look over here at this diagram, the reason that we put this in, so this is an infrared um, photograph image, image yeah. of this same space here. Now this is a lake and this is forested around it. 
This is um, probably a just planted field looks like. Maybe says, it's harvested. It says a wet meadow, so a damper, maybe an irrigated area. Oh, no, you're this, right. This is the wet meadow. And then there's two drier meadows. So if you look, the wet meadow is the same color as the forests and the water, right? This here is the same as here. It's a harvested meadow. Yeah. This color, if you look over here, it's the hottest, mm -hmm. this light color. It's the same color as the asphalt so that's, that's in the village. Yeah, that's pretty much bare soil. And so just think about, you know, if you want to, I mean, I don't know how we can get our own infrared views of our own homes. That would be so awesome. But think about your own place and think about where would be your very cool mm -hmm, spaces mm -hmm. and where might be your really hot spaces. Yeah. So, and this would be what, you know, concrete and um, even gravel and even and roofs and even rooftops yeah. looks like. So yeah. we're not saying don't use what's being recommended. We're saying, how can you mediate um, it? Me yeah, mediate it. How mm -hmm. can you use it with fire resistant plants and fire resistant um, mulch that we're going to talk about? Mm -hmm. What are the best practices around that? Yeah. <clears throat> so that you can have as much of this blue going on around you. That's right. Um, or this little bit of green as, as possible. It will absolutely have a positive yeah. impact on your life in general. You know, whether or not it's like the massive fire like it was here in Santa Cruz last mm -hmm. year and just melted everybody's cars to a pulp yeah. <laughs> and their windows. Okay, fine, but yeah, <clears throat> and we're addressing all of this on, you know, like the, the residential scale, but all of these things that we're talking about, they actually improve global climate stability as well when they're, they're um, implemented on a large enough scale. So if enough of us really can embrace like, oh, let's pump water into our landscapes, water that we already used, water that's already falling on us, not water that we're pumping out of a nearby river or, or, a, well, or, or a well, but just water that's available to us, pump, keeping it in the landscape, then we're imitating what the forests used to do on the planet on this larger scale that really contributed to our stability and our ability to, um, to for the, the planet's ability to maintain stable heat and wind and temperature across the, the whole globe. Okay, is everybody yeah. doing okay? Are there any questions or clarifying things in the chat, Nicole, that you can see? We're all good. Okay. Okay. We're all Super. good. We're all good. So we're going to move on. Um, we just wanted to have, so again, we mentioned as, you know, with, as a design science, we have those zones that we're working in. Mm -hmm. So normally zones in the permaculture um, world, they're considered things, you know, aspects, regions. Regions, regions of where you live, where you invest the most energy. Mm -hmm. So that still works here yeah. because the zone zero, one, and two you're wanting to invest and engage some time with, right? And we're gonna go into that. So what we wanna introduce are, this, are the sectors. So the sectors, these are energies or influence coming from outside in, okay? Yeah. So, so the zones again, those are again, those are my, um, that's my wood pile that I now have to move from right next to my house. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's like where you, which where zone you, you put store them. things right. in. Where yeah. my zone, I put them and store them in. Yeah. So we just wanted to presence these. We're not, you don't have to memorize these and you'll get this whole PowerPoint later. So yeah. the these sectors that we are looking at specifically as designers to design with fire in mind are these, which we already talked about wind and water. So, um, and the water is all water. It's rain, it's fog, mm -hmm. it's snow, it's mm -hmm. gray water. Moist it's, soil. It's moist soil. It's water in your plants. Yes. Right? So it's everything. Yeah. Um, and it's your roof catchment, which yeah. we said is rain. But yeah. And then the vegetation. So looking around in my vegetation. So is my vegetation um, extreme fuel load? Right? We've all heard that term. Mm -hmm. or, a lot of dry stuff. Or, or is this vegetation a buffer? Yeah. Is this vegetation going to slow because it's such water, such high water content that it's going to actually have an impact where it's going to cool first? So if you have a slower yet intense fire moving, right, um, you, you want to really look at what the vegetation is. And yeah. then your soil, which we talked about, um, your, the microclimate. So the microclimates are just the difference between, I mean, there, there are many things, mm -hmm. but like my backyard and my neighbor's backyard, right. how hot it is and, and our also ability yeah, yeah how moist it is or dry it is yeah. exactly yeah um so slope and aspect we're going to talk about so for those of you who live on slopes you know how you're going to create your lush landscape is going to be slightly different mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about that yeah um 
because fire moves faster uphill and trees catch each other on fire when they're, you know, approaching at that angle. Um, and did you say about aspect? No, go ahead. no, yeah. So aspect is just the way the angle, the direction that the slope is facing. So if you have a south facing slope and has a south aspect, it's going to heat up a lot more yeah. than a north facing slope. So that's relevant too. And west slopes are drier than east slopes. So understanding your landscape from that. Yeah. And so if you haven't noticed yet, this is really an invitation for you all too. If you haven't already, you know, look at your look at your property or where yeah. you live um, from Google Earth. Like, get some maps out. They're, it's super fun and start to think about well, where what direction does the wind come from? Yeah. Where do I get most of my water? What's my vegetation? Where is yeah. it hot? Where is it, it going to be hot and cold? Yeah. Do I have slope? What is the aspect? Um, yeah. And then to look at infrastructure. So where are the nearest power lines? Are you in danger of having having a power line fall in your two property somewhere? Mm -hmm. How might you? Um, respond to that your propane tanks the roads um, storage yeah um, places where sparks can come from or flammables are located right and also maybe you have a you have a swimming pool and the swimming pool, pool can be a benefit yeah. so what are you yeah. going to put around there so it can these are mostly some of the ones that could be seen as more um, flammable or right. high risk but, but yeah. look at it the other way as well exactly. what do you have that is existing that would you know retaining walls exactly um, depending on what they're made out of can be very helpful in deflecting a, or yeah, uh, resisting a fire for a yeah. while. So a stone wall and an irrigation ditch can be very um, effective fire yeah. buffers. Yeah. And then the last one is animals. And so animals, we just had to put it on here. We're not going to have time today to go into it, but having just worked up in uh, Benicia and um, seen some of the projects and uh, properties where people live, you know, some of you have the ability to use animals and livestock on your properties. And so we have a friend down here um, near Coralitos and their little neighborhood has, they have a guy who has like five goats mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he just loans the goats out to, to go and mow all of the grass off yeah. of their properties. And so it's a win-win. He doesn't have to buy them food. Mm -hmm. They don't have to mow or till or do whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's really cool ways that animals. And so we have put at the, in the last two slides, there's, um, there is a wonderful presentation on um, on grazing for wildlife uh, fire prevention, and it's really great. Not only do the animals eat the tall grasses and really lower the fuel load, but that eating of the grasses that they do makes the roots go deeper, which brings mm -hmm. water up closer to the surface and has new growth happen, which is also more resistant to fires. Mm -hmm. And they pee and they poo. Yeah. You know, which is and, also good for your plants. And it's important to educate yourself because it can be done wrong. You know, you can have your animals overgraze and then leave another totally bare compacted right. area that's just reflecting heat. So right. so we're gonna we're gonna mention it here and it's there are definitely some resources in the at the end of this presentation that yeah. you can look up all on your own. It just it's yeah. super exciting, I think, for us. But so back to this diagram, this is not to scale, right? Because this is your zero to five feet to, um, to 30 to 100. And then this is just beyond. Just beyond yeah. And the three, you know, we, again, we're not for today, but this is a really exciting topic is to talk about three as your neighborhood and your community. Mm -hmm. How can you create whole fire resistant neighborhoods, yeah, neighborhood communities plan. and yeah. plants? How yeah. can you help each other? gather each other's water, you know, share goats, if that's the type of place yeah. that you live in. So if that's an exciting thing to think about, but what you yeah. want to do is you just want to, so if this for your home in the middle, start to look at, well, here's a wildlife corridor. Here's where I get cold winter wind. Here's where fires usually come. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you've got some power lines over here. So just- And your slopes. And your fire slopes. comes up slope and all of that. Yeah. Right. So if this is a view- this, uh, you can't see it on here, but this view might be that this is the top of a hill mm -hmm. and this, it it, this the, goes down. Yeah. So those things are all the things you're going to want to consider yeah. when you're putting together the most beautiful, lush yeah. landscape. And just noticing that this must be an Australian diagram because it has the sun <laughs> in the north. So just take note that in this hemisphere, the sun. I know we are always still like, comes don't from do the that. south. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in Australia. I mean, north is up. That's good. But this is so, yes. Okay. All right, so let's get on in here. So, um, do we need to go over this again? Not so much. We're going to talk about. Um, well, so again, you want to take all of those sectors that we just mentioned, and think about them in in these three zones. Yes. Yeah. So water in in zone zero, vegetation, yeah. right? All of the things we just infrastructure, um, animals for that matter. Everything. What's how? What is this looking like in zone zero? What is this looking like in zone one? 
and what is this looking like in zone two? Yeah. And so we're just going to start to give you some. Yeah. And in the materials that we've linked for you, you can see that there are very different recommendations or requirements for, um, you know, how high up off the ground you have to remove the limbs, how far apart shrubs can be, how tall they can be. Um, it's it's a lot around just how connected are they for fire to spread through them. So it's very common sense when you get into it, and all those details are in the references that we read. And so we love <laughs> we love lists. By the way, we love lists and we love plant lists. <laughs> and so I can't even tell you how many plant lists we have read. Oh my God, on fire resistant plants of Northern California, Australia, Oregon, the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. So we've definitely shared those resources with you, but we yeah. also found that the same plant can be on the most fire prone plant list. Yes. And, and oh, also on the safe list. Safe list too. Yeah. Huh. Why is that? So we thought instead of giving you all those lists, because you can literally just go to, I think, Salado County RCD and find, yeah. and we did give you some. Mm -hmm. And just to know, and we'll just move on to the next slide, <coughs> that what's really important is to think about these characteristics of fire resistant plants. Yes. And Rather than, I mean, yes, there are some plants that are just really well known for being really very fire resistant. Mm. Um, and also really flame prone. And really flame prone. <laughs> yeah. The thing to consider again is everything we already mentioned, all the sectors, but to also make sure that you choose plants for your luscious landscape that, that thrive where you are. So yeah. what it's to get to know what your hardiness zone is, if that's something you're not familiar with, because you don't want to start bringing in plants even if they're the most absolutely highest rated fire resistant plants, right. if, they don't, if they die, because <laughs> yeah. that defeats the purpose, right? Yeah. Then you have a dead dry plant where you wanted to have something thriving. So, yeah. so um, various fire resistant plants include plants that have high salt content. Yeah, um, so like ice plant. And there's that New Zealand spinach that's very salty, like strange things, but they're, yeah. they don't burn. Right. Um, and then fleshy or watery leaves. So a lot of succulents and cacti. Succulents, and ca yeah, cacti. Um, but the fig could also. Has the, yeah, the fleshy. They have the, the fig fleshy, fleshy and watery leaves. So it was the yeah. fig and which other one that had, they have this latex. The fig and the mulberry. The fig and the mulberry trees have this latex. They have like a white sap inside. And mm -hmm. that sap, this latex sap is known to be Fire resistant. Very, very yeah. fire resistant. And so if you can find plants that have that and just confirm with your local nursery person that this is the same, although I, we've read many plants have it. Yeah. So yeah, you could infer that any plant with a milky sap, but you know, just double check. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thick insulating bark, um, have their lowest branches clear of the ground, and then they have dense crowns. Yeah. Um, so we put a few up here. So this is one of our favorite is the um, Ceanothus, also the California mountain lilac. lilac. And they come in all sorts and they're known to be very, very fire resistant. Um, Toyan is here. And Toyan, I didn't even, I just learned that from, um, I mean, I knew that this was a Toyon, but um, it's also known as a Christmas berry or mm. a California holly and Hollywood mm. was named after the Toyon berry. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with Toyons having grew up, grown up in LA. <clears throat> um, fig trees with the sap and then, and pretty much all- um, All the fruit trees. All the fruit trees, yeah. specifically uh, stone fruits, the figs, the berries, yeah. even the shrubs, not yeah. the trees are very, very fire resistant. And so, so really like it's these deciduous plants that are the least fire prone because they have more moisture in their leaf bodies. So right. when you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? Pine needles and redwood duff and all that stuff. It's even when it's green, it's so much drier than a maple leaf or, or a fig leaf or an apple leaf or whatever. And then, um, you know, if you read some of the materials from the California Native Plant Society that we sent, they also were not so big on lists. They, they kept saying, you know, it's really how you're maintaining the plants that's yeah. more important than exactly which plants it is. Right. And same with the UC uh, Marin Master Gardeners Program. They were, they were actually like, <clears throat> there is no list of plants that are fire resistant that <laughs> has been peer reviewed or, or are scientifically based. And that was really enlightening yeah. to us. And yeah. that was very freeing, actually. So, so we said, oh. It, well, it's Inference people's experience, experience, people who care. Yeah. So again, know your area, know what works for you. Talk to people in your area, wherever you are. And that's seriously, if you're in Solano County, but you're in, you know, 
Vallejo, right? Mm -hmm. It's also, or Benicia. Mm -hmm. It could be really be different. Really different. It could yeah. be really, really different. So yeah. just be open to that and, you know, strike up some good friendships if you don't already have it with your RCD or with your local mm -hmm. nurseries. And yeah. you actually all have some pretty, pretty good nurseries, nurseries up yeah. there. But then just really think <laughs> about like looping back to the water. Okay, any plant is going to be more fire resistant if it has its optimal water content in its tissues. And even the most fire resistant plant, if it's getting really dried out and it's been in a prolonged drought where it hasn't really had enough for years, it's going to be fire prone. So just keep looping it back to the water and the life. Okay, so these are sort of the fire resistant plants. And again, there is there are lists on the back two slides. Yeah. We're just want to talk more about strategies. Um, so fire prone plant characteristics, we talked about this a bunch and a lot of these we know, uh, know already. This is a juniper, um, this is an acacia, highly flammable, and a eucalyptus. There is one eucalyptus that has somehow made it on all the fire resistant. <laughs> uh, I don't yeah. know, I'm not, I'm not doing the, <laughs> yeah. the eucalyptus for fire resistant myself. Right. Um, and then these are the things you want to sort of think about, right, yeah. when they've you're choosing. Got that, they've got the fibrous loose bark that's going to catch and fly burning embers. They've got volatile oils in their leaves where they actually could sort of explode vapors. They have volatile resinous foliage and very dry foliage, and they retain or accumulate dead leaves and twigs. So, you know, a lot of plants um, that we love because they drop a lot of material for mulch, they also are maybe not so great because they drop a lot of material for mulch. So we're, we're finding that sweet spot and again, working with the water. How do we keep things wet? Oh yeah. So just, just a reminder what we already talked about, but just wanted to kind of give it to you. They also give some really good um, distance. And so, you know, as landscape designers ourselves and lover of gardens, you know, it's, it's, maybe this so you know the capricorn in me is like awesome i love it being this clear mm -hmm. right three to five feet mm -hmm. 18 feet you know in this zone 12 feet in this zone six feet in this zone uh -huh. but then it depends on your slope and it depends on the size of the tree you know i can kind of go there but we also just want to invite you all to just again that first principle that we talked about is to really go and observe mm -hmm. Right. Who else is living on your property if you're, you know, lucky to have a large property? What other critters are there? What other animals are you also going to be maybe creating habitat for? Because they're mm. also good for you to have. Um, and to just so to use these um, and feel empowered by it, not not. Oh, oh no. Yeah. Right. Just. But the observation point that Anne is making is so important because, you know, when you think about the previous list, you would think about cypress trees as being very flammable. But again and again and again, fires have swept through areas in the Mediterranean and the cypress have been left standing. So there's more going on than what we actually understand yeah. and can, you know, make pamphlets about. So this is so important to observe and really keep thinking all the time. Okay. And so this, again, this will be um, on your thing and we'll just super fast. So the zero to five foot, they actually don't want any tree. It's, it's recommended that there's no trees yeah. or shrubs or bushes maybe annuals, but they also are recommending, it's also highly recommended that you use non-combustible, like completely non-combustible um, mulch, which granite and um, mm -hmm. gravel, gravel is considered. Limestone, um, all concrete, those, but yeah. Uh, but some places, um, including some in Cal Fire say, well, if you're gonna do it, mix it in, and we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. So this intermediate zone, the five to 30 feet, um, this is where you can plant more and we'll talk about the different. So basically we're going to be talking about gray water and roof catchment, like from your home out mm -hmm. into this 30 foot area. It's completely reasonable and mm -hmm. not expensive. will save you money in the end and keep your property more um, moist. And then as you get out here and out here, um, there's all kinds of things you can do if you have out out sheds, mm -hmm. you can do roof catchment. from out buildings. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can use roof from out buildings. Maybe you have a seasonal pond that you can mm -hmm. pump up. Again, not sure where everybody is, but we'll save that for the Q&A. Swales, swales for runoff that also reduce erosion um, and infiltrate water into the ground. Those are a great strategy for those farther out distances as well as in close. Okay, so just quick. Okay. okay, all right. So here is, here's the crux of what we got going on here. What we want to bring to you tonight is that incorporating what we have coined the moist soil moat, or um, it's just a big zone of saturated soil, incorporating that moist soil moat into your defensible space really allows you to keep that lush landscape. So we're keeping our on-site water on-site, that's our rain, snow, fog, condensation, and gray water, and we're creating 
this safe, moist, cool area around our homes. Right. And just to say, we found this beautiful picture. There was no more information about it, but we were like, okay, <laughs> it's not a case study. let's just be really transparent. It's not a case study, but we would like to imagine that for everybody for their homes yeah. <laughs> that you know they're protected and again if there was if, you know and you look at these this is rather very very green all around mm -hmm. what didn't burn and they have it just seems like a little water structure here or mm -hmm. water um feature there pool. so a pool okay so we're gonna move on okay okay so how do we keep the the soil moist how do we keep our water on our landscapes and we are going to do that by reducing evaporation and reducing temperature through mulch and plants. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mulch because that's a big hot topic, right? Mulch is burned. Are they safe? What can I use? More on that next. Um, so reducing evaporation and temperature and then creating the soil storage through the soil sponge, which we've talked about, which needs organic matter and plants and microbes. Soils and berms and infiltration basins, we'll get into next, there are earthworks. So ways of moving soil around to allow it to catch water and soak it in. And then all of the plants that we've talked about and just, you know, layers of plants and green plants and moist wet plants and how they all act, interact together and hold water in their bodies and in the ground. Ponds and wet areas, of course. And then increasing that water input by directing our rainwater into the ground, reusing our gray water, and um, taking advantage of that condensation drip from trees by having something alive underneath them that can soak it up. Right. And just in case someone is on who doesn't know what gray water is, right? Ah, what's gray water? What is gray water? Lydia. It's gently used water. <laughs> <laughs> gray water is all the water that you already used in your house, not including your toilets. Or your kitchen sink. And some places your kitchen sink. That's so considered black water. Laundry, sinks, shower, bath. Um, and some people are using their air conditioning condensate drip and things like that. Um, but yeah, the kitchen sink and the toilet is too much organic matter, too much yuckety yuck, particularly the toilet. Um, and so those get to go to their own secure location. But all of the rest of that water we can bring out on our landscapes and really use it to, to right. fuel this lush it's landscape. It's really, we cannot impress enough. I mean, it's one of the most underutilized resources that we all have on site that we are all not using. Yeah. Well, some of you out there might Are totally using, be doing yes. this. Okay, so my apologies. Mm -hmm. But if not, you know, we're already, if it's water that's already coming into our house, we're already paying for it. Yeah. It's water falling from the sky. It's free. Yeah. So win, 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 win. And the statistics are that roughly 50% of your total water use is indoor and the other 50% is outdoor. So you, the same water that you already used indoor, you can reuse outdoor and really contribute to your fire safety and your overall yeah. so, cool mm -hmm. moistness. Big proponents of that. So yes. Did you want to um, go into any of these? It's just the tanks and the soil. We're good? I think we are. Yeah, we're good. Okay, let's go on. So here's just the soil sponge, right? We can't leave you without a really good visual of the soil sponge. There's creatures in there. It's alive. There's air. There's wet stuff. Um, and it's a sponge, literally, like you could grab this in your hand and squeeze it and, and water would come out. Now, it's not going to look like that in August anywhere in California or September or October, but it's still going to have that um, ability to hold itself together. It's going to have that poor moisture where the plants are still able to take some up to fuel their own metabolisms and the organisms are still alive. So it's still got that core moisture. Yeah. And by doing the swales and the berms that we're going to talk to you in a moment in, in with the gray water, as Lydia has mentioned several times, mm -hmm. and the roof catchment, it can be yeah, pretty darn moist. I mean, maybe not, yeah, it gets yeah. dried out. So let's talk about, so if we're wanting to build the soil carbon sponge, um, and we did, did we put in extra soil carbon sponge resources at the end? Um, I think we did. I think we did. Yeah. We will make sure it's there before we PDF it and send it along. Yeah. Um, uh, so how are we going to do that? So we've already mentioned water, plants, soil, mulch, mm -hmm. organic matter. Reducing basically. evaporation, reducing temperature. Okay, so let's. So we wanted, this was really <laughs> exciting for us yeah. because people kept telling us, I can't use mulch anymore. Yeah. I think I'm going to try that. Um, I think I'm going to try that like ground up rubber stuff. Oh yeah. You know, cause it's not flammable. Right. Well, we all want it. We're trying to protect our soil, right? right? And we're people, trying. and so just to say also that, you know, most people are doing, I, I mean, I, I'm going to say everyone it's because they really, they care and, or they're scared mm -hmm. and they're really wanting to just have their home be safe. Yeah. Right. So, 
And there's a lot of interesting information out there. So we've really tried to bring it in, but this yeah. graph is really helpful because it has the different types of mulch here along the bottom and then relative by value, um, values by combustion characteristics. So flame height, rate of speed and temperature. So if you look at here, the shredded rubber is not looking good. And I know that some people think, I mean, I do not like shredded rubber. I do not like the way it smells or mm -hmm. the way it feels or whatever, but it's very high temperature. The rate of speed for spreading is not slow by any means. And the flame height is quite, it's the highest. Mm -hmm. um, it's up there. It's, it's a worse petroleum than, product. It's a petro we're yeah. burning gasoline, yeah. right? So pine needles are just the next ones, but look at composted wood chips down here. Looking right? pretty good. So even though, even though um, definitely beach PG&E, and probably Cal Fire will say zero, um, like really just like pea gravel and concrete and mm -hmm. pavers around your home. In that zone zero. There are actual ways and they, and Cal Fire for sure has done this and we would recommend mm -hmm. if this is what you want and you feel open to it, picking the fire resistant plants and putting them in places that aren't touching your house and just mixing, mm -hmm. having it be mixed in, not all concrete or pavers, mm -hmm. but having water infiltration basins, which we'll talk about in a moment, like say your downspout mm -hmm. goes into an area that's watering annuals around your house, that's going in to the, comp oh no, composted wood chips. And then um, you have some, you know, heart shaped or diamond shaped pavers yeah. in there so you can get in to grab your hose or just to have a little break. Mm -hmm. It looks beautiful. It's self-sustaining. Yeah. And and according to this um chart, the composted wood chips are the least they're pretty safe. Um, yeah. You know, they don't have gravel or concrete or pavers on here on because here. they're just considered zero. So but of all of these, they're really good. So yeah. we just wanted to give you some encouragement around right. that that yes, they can catch fire and they can um that's what I'm thinking of, uh, smolder right. rather than burn. So fire people might not see that, but if you know that and you know that down deep, it's actually still pretty moist and wet, either from the water infiltration mm -hmm. you're doing or the irrigation that you have, it's really not going to be yeah. so bad. So what, so what we're gathering and what we're trying to communicate is that if you, if you have small patches of stuff, like small patches of wood chips and small patches of plants with breaks in between of you know, some hardscaping or some open space, then the fire can't pass from one place to another and you might have a little isolated flare up, but then that burns out. Um, so it's, you know, like wood chips for miles all over is a no-no, but, but like sections of wood chips surrounded by chunks, clumps of green plants and traipsed through by little flagging stones or whatever, that actually works really well and is given the, the, red, the green light by the pg &E and the CAL FIRE, you know, they're like, okay. Not pg &E. Cal Fire is, and, and the Resource Conservation District, they're very yes. um, more open to more greenery and more organics. Right, because yeah. they also really in their writing, the Cal Fire writes some beautiful things and the, the Native Plant Society is gorgeous as well. Um, but everyone's really getting that, that people are panicking. panicking and that people still need to be surrounded by beauty because we're all just a little bit happier yeah. when we can just go and sit somewhere that's beautiful and cool and damp and... Right blooming or, or whatnot. Yeah. So, um, so very supportive of that. So, and again, we're making the problem worse when we take away all the green and all the life, because then we have these heat pockets and these heat islands that create more rising air that suck in more wind. So your neighbor's hardscape could actually fuel the wind that brought the fire into your safe green zone, you know, so we have to be thinking about the small patterns and the larger patterns at the same time. Okay. But here's some fun stuff. Here's some really fun stuff. Um, techniques for getting the water into the landscape and creating that moist soil moat, right? The MSM. The MSM, moist soil moat. MSMs for lush landscapes. Yes. Yes. So swale and berms, infiltration basins, and rain gardens. These are primary ways that we can get the water into the earth and facilitate that soil sponge. And save water at the same time. It seems yeah. counterintuitive, but here we are, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Keep it from running downhill. Keep it from leaving your property. Keep it in your soil. Um, yeah. And so this is actually an example of, this would be the rain garden. Yeah. Yes. So this is a seasonal rain garden. So here, can't see a lot of it, but this would be, probably be is the berm mm -hmm. where it's planted. And then this seasonally fills up with water and there are water loving plants in here. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it stays it soaks moist, in. it yeah. soaks in. And yeah. so then it just, it, you know, it dries out, but it's actually just, it's sinking in. And yeah. then the next year, 
um, when it's raining or you have more water catchment or maybe, yeah, depending on what you do here and how the water gets there can fill up again. So features like that, mm -hmm. um, and you can do that within that zone one, which is up to yeah. 30 feet. Yeah. And they can be lovely, cooling, green, and pleasing to the eye. Yes. And, and this, this pit, you, you've dug <laughs> out a basin, basically, and you filled it with organic matter to absorb the water, and you're directing the water into this basin. And so all that organic matter, where if it had been like a brush pile above ground, would have been a dried out flammable danger. Now it's in a basin that's being fed water, and so it's able to decompose faster and become moist organic matter instead of a fuel load, right? Yeah. So um, in the rain gardens and in the swales that we're going to talk about next, this is a really effective way of incorporating that carbon and that organic matter onto your site, but keeping it safe, keeping it in the ground and cool and moist. So, so <laughs> this is this is a very busy slide. And so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. All we wanted to do was say, we wanted to just let you know that through roof water catchment, um, uh, there's rainwater is out there. And yeah. when Solano County, was it 24 inches or 20 it's annual? All, it's all changing now. But, um, you yeah. know, a lot of us live where we can get between 18 and 24 inches of rain in a year. Yeah. And you can look up the formulas if you haven't been exposed to that side of permaculture yet and figure out how to find out how many actual gallons of water are coming out of each downspout of your house. And you can figure that out in, you know, a couple of inches, like a three-day storm or in the whole year. And, you know, then just, just using this to figure out, okay, what can I do with this water? Where do I put it? Look around. What's an area that needs water where maybe it's forested downhill for me? I know fire is going to come from this direction. Um, you can look and see where would you like to have more moisture around you just in general, right? So, um, and then we also, we should include when we send it the just how to figure <laughs> out how much roof water you're getting. Yeah, this the is standard, the, down the standard formula we'll, we'll send you. But yeah, this has been more useful to us because it does break it down by downspout instead of those general ones where like your whole roof can catch X number of gallons, but where, like here onto the driveway or over here into the orchard? So it's really nice to break it down for yourself and figure out where you can put each volume. Yeah. And then, yeah, how far it needs to go. Yeah. So again, we understand that this, you this know, just, a lot. just come back to this if this is something, you know, that you really, really want to do. And if you have questions, you know, feel free to contact us. Absolutely. Yeah. And this um, information is readily available, but in many different forms that can be confusing. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, so here's your best starting place yeah. for this work. If you're like, I am ready to make my soil, moist soil moat and start to fire, um, fire help my landscape. Yeah, and, and make it lush. Make it time. lush, yeah. So the swales are basically trenches. They're on contour trenches. And you can see in the little cartoon here, if you just dug around the top of a hill, you would have a circular swale. And then the lower image is a kind of a cross section of a swale. And you take the, the, the earth out of the swale and you pile it up just downhill, creating a berm. And then what we like okay. to do is fill those swales with the organic matter that we keep talking about. So you have essentially a level filled trench with organic matter in it, and then a mound of soil downhill from it. And you plant your plants on the, on the mound of soil, on the berm, and water goes into the swale and soaks in and it stays cool and moist because it's full of organic matter and the plants access that soil. So you can create cool, moist niches and microclimates, like a whole band of um, plants that are lush and green and beautiful and really creating a lot of nice humidity. And you can build these subterranean water storages and you can keep your carbon and your woody material on the landscape. And you got your lush fire safe landscape going on. And there's more fun images of these, these swales. Yeah, let's go, let's see. So this is just awesome. We found this on Living Permaculture uh, PNW. PNW. And this is so brilliant. And this is really great for conversations around fire and long-term visioning and planning and designing. So this is really showing, so maybe you can see a little bit better. So this, in, this is the swale, what goes down. Mm -hmm. and so how we do it, it's about a foot to a foot and a half deep and about a foot, foot and a half, foot to, and a half two to two feet, feet wide. wide. So these are our pathways. So here it says water level, which is fine. We fill it like that's our wood chip level. This is right our there. wood chip level. Or, you know, when I do a bunch of tree pruning, I cut that way down and I put those on the bottom of the swale mm -hmm. and then put 
more organic matter on top or the composting wood chips, which are not very fire prone. And then on the berm, I, there's things that are planted. So what's so cool is so when, then it, when it rains or when my downspouts go in here or, or when the oops, washing machine sorry, water, <laughs> um, the water sinks in. Yeah. So that foot and a half deep swale, when the water, the water goes all the way in and then starts going into our soil. Mm -hmm. And so by year three, we are, you know, we're those, the, so wherever you put these swales and berms in your land, you're actually mm -hmm. increasing your water throughout your property, wherever, well, wherever you have the infiltration mm -hmm. opportunities and where you have your swales, yeah. which can double as paths and all types of different things. And I was yeah. kind of like, oh, well, maybe people should build, or we were talking today, you know, people with their propane tanks, where are they going to put them now? Because people mm -hmm. used to put them like right next to their house or under the door, mm -hmm. like, oh, well, maybe they could build, you know, a little, a, little, a little rooftop over their propane and catch water and create a little moat around the propane tank, right? That's fire safe and just helps it be protected a little bit yeah. more, right? Anyway, little aside. But so just, just think about the implications of this filling with rainwater that's directed off your roof and comes by itself over land during the rainy season. And then you keep putting the gray water in there throughout the dry summer so that there's always this influx of water and the saturated soil zone that joins up with other, you know, all the moisture joins up underground as it yeah. increases. And then all of that life that can sustain, it doesn't have to go dormant at the end of the summer. The trees never really dry out. It just becomes this um, slowly ever increasing moist living matrix. Yeah, just lovely. And the moist soil moat. And they're fun to make. So this is the one in my, in the garden and within which I'm relation with. <laughs> uh, so you can just sort of see, so we just dig it and it looks like this. And then what is dug out from here goes up onto here and becomes the berm. I should, we should have put a picture in what it looks like now. Yeah, it um, looks amazing now. But just to give you some pictures. So then, so the, then we cover this with organic, with, I'm sorry, yeah, organic matter mm -hmm. and wood chips. And this is not the same path, but this is the same type of look that you're getting. Yeah. Um, at the end, and this is all able to hold water um, and act as a path at the same time. Yeah, and then this berm is a really ideal place to plant those fire resistant trees. So for example, a big swale fed by roof water and gray water and then planted with fruit trees is a really great zone one feature for that five to 30 feet around your house. So you can have your lush orchard all around your house fueled by your own bathtubs and your own laundry water. Yeah, it's pretty brilliant. Pretty exciting, right? And, and feeding your lush landscapes that you're now going to have, and you're going to feel so much better. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. gray water, and then we can talk about the building. I know, we're going to do that. Excellent. Okay, so here we are, a little bit more detail on gray water, because this is such a pivotal piece of the whole moist soil moat um, strategy. And these two diagrams are really nice. The one on the left is from Laura Allen, the... Gray Water, Green Landscape, a reasonably new book that she just put out that has um, really nice step-by-step -step diagrams for dealing with all of these things, the washing machine, the sinks, the bath, etc. cetera. Um, but then I also, we also included this one here on the right. This is from Art Ludwig, oasisdesign.net. You can see the label right there. And this is just a close-up of the laundry going into um, a mini moist soil moat around a tree. And so you'll see right here, there's a little um, box thing. That's where the end of the pipe comes out. And this kind of shaded area is filled with wood chips or organic matter. The soil is planted, the tree is planted in actual soil here, but surrounded by continually re-moistening wood chips. And so this can be, um, you know, sort of a, a little pocket around the tree, or it can be into a swale with the berm planted with trees, as we showed you in the previous document or uh, slide. And then back up here on Laura Allen's, look how it's just being directed all around and going off to this tree over here and this tree over here so that you can really strategically plan this moist soil moat thing and really encompass your whole house with this moisture and cooler zone to protect you. Right. Yeah. And you can just, again, depending on your level of comfort and safety, you know, you, you, you can, you could mix gravel in. To the swale. Some people do. Yeah. Feel, I mean, we do not. We have different. We do not do that. But we just want to let you know that don't. Um, we, we wouldn't want you to just be thinking, oh, I, I don't want to do the swale and burn because I'm I'm really not comfortable with wood chips at all, right? right. So 
okay, but don't let that happen. You can do a mix. And even pg e says it can be three to four inches of, of wood chips. Of wood chips. Yeah. So you could do some with, in with, the zone gra one. Um, with gravel if you wanted or, or um, not gravel. Uh, anyway, the gravel and then the wood chips on top, it'll still have the effect of the water. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. just won't have, you know, what we like, as far as the soil sponge goes, you know, it's, there's more action in the soils, in the soil when the wood chips are right there right. and they're wet. They're just bringing in more microbes. Yeah. So the wood chips are food and the gravel food. is not food. Right. But it's also not flammable. But again, so. <laughs> just to say for your yeah. own feelings of comfort and safety and, and, yeah. and we don't, you know, Solano might be slightly different, although we did actually <laughs> look and we've, we've, um, yeah, the Solano RCD has a lot of the same resources as the Santa Cruz RCD. So that was nice to see. Um, but I think there is, um, a, a gray water landscape online thing happening through Laura Allen right now. I, I remember somebody mentioning it to me. Um, so there are a lot of ways to get this information now, especially since Corona and we have so, so much stuff online. So you can get yourself a good introduction and then coordinate and find somebody in your area who can help you install. Yeah, and you we, have a lot of good people up there, Venetia. Yeah. And we, we also included the link to her book, which is also yeah. the link to her website. So there's yeah. great, um, great information on there yeah okay and so we haven't really talked about tanks very much but obviously tanks for you know a static storage that you could use to wet down the house itself and the landscape and use to irrigate those are obviously super important um but we were really focusing on this the moist soil moat as our as our primary strategy for this um this talk tonight but we would do what we're going to talk about the let's talk let's go back i'm going to go back yeah. to just maybe those zones yeah, so Sorry about this. what we have found in doing um, consultations with people since the, you know, probably since 2017, when people started to be get, getting a little extra um, aware of what's going on, is that people are doing really dramatic things to their landscapes, like cutting down a lot of trees before they've done things to the house that will right. really improve the safety of the house. Like clean their gutters. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. literally, you know, we went to a lovely client and, um, you know, she had cut down this very old ancient um wisteria that was growing was around the house. house and so many oak trees and so many with that were i mean and again uh -huh. we completely understand why she was doing this she was very concerned and yet she, they had practically wrap around wooden decks mm -hmm. in the mountains yeah. that were completely open yeah. right so let's just talk about that for a yeah. moment <laughs> so, so you know, again if you're if you're going to be start starting to do all the tree work and the limbing make sure that your house and remember cal fire says that this this zone zero is the most important mm -hmm. of all of the defensible spaces because there are little things that we all don't really take time to consider yeah. that make our homes. So our turns yeah. out our homes are actually far more flammable and burn far hotter, hotter. and longer yeah. than any trees yeah. do. So because you, of the petroleum products that exactly. our culture <laughs> likes to make things out of, right? Yeah. That, that cause things to burn quicker. So you wanna start with this zone zero with hardening your house before you're doing any other tree removal or even limbing up, start with your zone zero. And this, the, the term hardening is a pretty good one, even though it doesn't sound particularly pleasant. And we've got a resource at the bottom for the Harden Your House retrofit from Cal Fire. Um, but it's about not letting the embers get into places where they can sit and catch fire. So any little nook and cranny, any little spot under the eaves, um, a, a, you know, a messed up bracket on a vent or an open vent, um, a space underneath the deck, like Anne was mentioning, sometimes around the window sills, um, sometimes where um, an awning meets the roof or another roof angle meets a wall, right? There's all these little places. So, you know, the big take home is to just, yeah, clean your gutters, make sure you don't have a dry compost situation happening up there. Right, and you want to do that anyway, because you're <clears> going to be <throat> adding more gutters to get your rainwater, water catchment from your roof. Mm -hmm. um, so just really engaging with that. So you're gonna wanna make sure those cleans get get screens if you can, that'll pre prevent like super mm -hmm. big buildup, although it can mm -hmm. get in there. Um, but the most impactful one that I think was for us was the decks. Yeah, well, um, I just wanted to say a little oh, bit more about cleaning, okay. cleaning off the roofs. So you'll also get a, a gathering of organic material around the skylights and at any of those funny little places where you have angles meeting other angles. And so you just want to get up there and sweep that all off. Just really get that cleaned out. Um, glass skylight covers are, are less flammable than plastic ones, but then more breakable. So, you know, things to 
think about there. And roof material is a whole nother can of worms that you can find stuff about. But yeah, let's talk about the decks because people have open decks and some people were even storing gas cans underneath decks or yeah. wood, wood materials, you know, old um, lumber that you were saving for another project. And um, that's so much more dangerous than having a tree <laughs> or a bunch of trees. Right, because remember, we didn't, we didn't put this, there's a our wonderful woman, um, Judith Schwartz, mm -hmm. who wrote Water, Water Everywhere. And just love one of the things she says is that uh, trees are like vertical rivers, Yeah. right? And so if you think about these trees that you know are fire resistant and holding a lot of water, like your European deciduous trees or your fruit trees, and just mm -hmm. think of that in that way, just the mm -hmm. amount of water that they're able to hold yeah. can have a whole alive and healthy you. right as right. opposed to your dry deck right so what's recommended for um deck safety is you know defensible space around the deck so removing the vegetation that's touching it and then enclosing it with um the underneath yeah enclosing the underneath not the top part but that whole space where you can crawl under enclosing that with basically window screening and there's different you know, quarter inch size mesh or one sixteenth inch size mesh. No shorter than, no, no smaller than a quarter inch. No smaller than yeah. a quarter inch because you don't want the embers to go through and get under there and do their thing. Um, and there's also different things like masonite boards or like concrete clad siding that you can put on that's, that's helpful to close things out. Um, you know, and then you can still have a little door and store non-flammable materials under there. You just don't want to be storing all your, um, you know, your wood and obviously not your propane. Right. And if you have plants on your deck, they just recommend that you either use something that's treated, which we probably mm -hmm. wouldn't recommend, or you can use the clay pots. You can, you can still have plants on your deck. You're just not wanting them to be, yeah. you know, in something that's highly flammable. And right. you probably also want to look and make sure that those are all well um, irrigated and tended. Exactly. Yeah. And just on that note, just if we didn't say it already, that um, again, irregardless of whether you're choosing to go along with with pg e or Cowscape or RCD or all of the above or whatever, that all of them will say that the most important thing, spacing is really important, mm -hmm. especially with slope, but it's that you, we all have to just be a bit more invested in tending our, our, our land, tending our landscapes, mm -hmm. tending our trees. So we're let, making sure that the dead branches do get taken out and mm -hmm. that they do get pruned. And, you know, I love that it, even Cal Fire said, you know, you don't get get all of the dead leaves out from under your trees, but you can dig them back into right. the soil so that you're not just raking and taking all your organic matter and sending it away. You can rake it and yeah. dig it in. You can put it into your swales yeah. for that matter, right? So um, that's really the most important. And they really make a very, all of them, I think, bring yeah. that up. And, and if you're tending. and if you're getting like acquiring wood chips or you're chipping things that you've cut and cleared on your own land, just distinguish between the top leafy part, like maybe chip that into one pile, and then the more woody chippy part. So those woody chips are the less flammable. That's what you want to put in your closer to the house zones. And that leafy stuff, you more want to compost, like use that to fill the rain garden or actually work it in with, you know, maybe you have animals and you can work it in with some animal or, manure into a proper compost pile. Yeah. yeah, so that you don't export them, you're not getting rid of them, but you're not having a lot of leaves that are drying out on the surface and then being a flammable issue later. But yeah, we want to save as much of our material as possible. So as we're doing all this clearing, not wanting to have dry brush piles, um, that's where the swales again are just amazing because you can chip everything up and use it to fill the swale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we just touched a little bit on, I mean, mostly for the home retrofits, we really want you all to consider the gray water, which is easy and affordable and, and can be very simple to maintain. Again, some of you might have some more complicated laundry or bathroom scenarios that we're mm -hmm. not familiar with. Um, it can be funny. It can be funny. And then the roof water catchment, um, the water catchment and mm -hmm. the um, the earthworks yeah. um, are gonna you're gonna find that you're going to be able to even save money on water. Everybody will think you're spending way more, more than your it'll look so five green. CCUs or yeah. whatever, <laughs> right? Because it's gonna look so green and so yeah. lush and cooler and more moist and the more humidity, right? Or yeah. in the air. Um, 
And so, yeah, these easy retrofits from zone zero that you infiltrate into the zone one, more or less, you know, the roof and the gray water, and then out in the zone two, having that from, sorry, I'm always pointing at the screen, you can't see me, um, in the zone two, using whatever the natural landscape runoff is, um, then, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach for all the way around the house, really, to get this moist soil mode in place. Wonderful. And it's really, it's kind of self-establishing or self-maintaining, right? Once you have the moisture in the soil and the plants, they kind of hold each other together. Yeah, they like it. It's, yeah. And so will you. It'll smell good. Yeah. yeah. And there's so many lovely plants that are the fire resistant ones that we were so happy to see. Yeah. On there. Yeah. So in general, like the safest stuff around your house is the food plants. So yeah. even more than California natives, which are fire resistant, but they're designed to burn and recover more than they're designed not to burn. So but native plants are recommended. Yeah, there are, are definitely there are recommended. so many. If you type in California native fire resistant native plants, you'll find multiple lists. <clears throat> so just find a list that is the closest fit yeah. to your area and talk with your local nursery about yeah. the um, about its hardiness and its ability to thrive exactly where right. you are. Because things down in town, you know, maybe things in the mountains, maybe things out in the Central Valley, like they have different capacities. Um, but yeah, isn't that great news that you that the best place to grow the food is right around the house and to infiltrate the water is right around the house and it'll make a fire safe envelope or a fire resistant envelope. Um, and just one more time, like there's nothing that's fireproof this, this whole discussion is really about making ourselves fire safer using water and life through the yeah. permaculture lens. Which just happens to be, you know, increasing the air quality around us. Right, the temperature so many side and benefits. aesthetically pleasing aspects too. So yeah. great. Well, we're going to end right there at 615 because we would love to hear if there are any questions yeah. from we'll, all of you. We'll stop the share. Thank you, Anne and Lydia. I really appreciate how you're showing us on how to get creative using like common sense with all these challenges. It's like some, so often we do things and we don't think about it, right? Like just even, you know, cutting down the trees, but then the, you know, all the leaves in the gutter. So thank yeah. you so yeah. much. And I love the, um, that awesome graph of the the combustibility of the um, wood chips. Right. Yeah, that was so powerful. That was a powerful visual. I yeah. um, everybody's so afraid of it, but then when you look at it in comparison to the petroleum base, that was that was really. Yeah. Cool. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Yes, um, thank you. And you've taken the time to learn how to do this with your landscape and um, what 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 and all these challenges that we face, how can we get creative? So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to ask you all to fill out a short survey. So this really helps to guide the topics of the programs that we select to bring to you. I read them all and really look to bring in um, classes that you're interested in. And also um, lets us know what support you need to be able to transform your yards to, to lush landscapes, to grow food, to create habitat, build healthy soil, and use water efficiently. So um, please fill out the um, survey, and I think Allison's going to put that in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate you doing that. And then another thing that's upcoming, we are having... Um, some flood walks through Sassoon City on June 12th and June 17th, and these are going to be in person. So here you'll learn more about the environmental impacts of flooding, rising sea levels, and rainwater management through an interactive tour through Sassoon City's future resilient neighborhoods. So I encourage you to check, um, check those flood walks out. And it's so amazing how we talk about all these flood, drought, fire, you know, and how to keep keeping resilient through it. So please, if anyone has any questions, enter them into the chat because we want to take this opportunity of having Anna and Lydia here to answer any questions you might have. Let's see. I don't see any questions. I don't see any questions. Any comments or things you've used that worked well for you? Oh, oh here we go. Corey Birds. Do you have any thoughts on differences between direct gray water to irrigation lines versus an intermediary storage? What is the longevity of these gray water systems relative to clean or black water infrastructure? Well, so the, the line you'll hear when you get into gray water is you're never supposed to store it for more than 24 hours. And, you know, whatever you can, people are always bending the rules. And the thing with gray water is that 
is there's very little illness from it, but when you do store it, it gets stinkier and it's yuck. So usually direct discharge onto the landscape is the way to go. Yeah. Um, and the longevity of these gray water systems. So um, sometimes they clog and if you don't have a good map and you can't find the clog, that can be extremely yeah. frustrating, which I've experienced <laughs> trying to help people out with that. Um, making sure that you have a clean out so that you can put a high pressure hose in there and like blast through, that usually takes care of it. And that might need to be done once a year, might not need to be done for five or six years. Um, but yeah, they have, they have really great lifespan unless, you know, there's somebody digging up the soil and breaking the pipes underground. So yeah, they're, they're a great solution. Um, a concern about storing moisture near the homes foundation. Yeah. So too close. You don't want to be too close. You want to, um, have up, uphill storage kind of directing around the side so that you're not infiltrating right above your house. And then, um, side and downhill storage, depending on your soil, depending on your foundation, um, 10 feet from the house is about the recommendation. Sometimes you can get away with a little bit closer. And honestly, so many people have um, foundation problems under their houses without swales. They've already got pumps under there. Um, you know, let's just go ahead and infiltrate the water for landscape and fire safety and just pump whatever extra water we have to pump out that we were already pumping out, just pump that into a swale further away. Um, um, any plants or branches we would avoid for a swale? Oh, to put in the swale, material to go in there? Yeah, so that's what I'm understanding. I don't know. So Bonnie, yeah. you had your hand raised also, but that's, is this was your question? We, we pretty much put anything in there. I mean, yeah. nope, I would avoid poison oak. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't get it, like me, I mean, whatever. It's just no fair. She doesn't get it, so then she gets to clear it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, some people talk about, you know, eucalyptus or, or walnut, and they have certain tannins or um, oils in them that inhibit growth. But honestly, it's going to be years before those compounds are coming into contact with plant roots and in the presence of the moisture and the darkness and the soil microbes, it's, it's all really getting broken down. So use what you have. Yeah. I mean, literally I just use everything that I have on my, on the, on the property. So all of the, all of the prunings and the trimmings. Um, yeah. And then the leaves. Yeah. Um, right in the swale and then it, because I like how it looks and I look out on it I do use some nice wood chips that I love to top it off yeah then it lasts longer and then I'll just keep adding adding best, more yeah the best quality on the top and just also on a note on that just again because we're talking about moisture and I completely understand the concern around people think of wood chips as being really dry and of course so flammable but in the wood chips that I have in my two main berms closest to my house you know, I could dig in there today after heat waves. It's it's still moist mm -hmm. down there, mm -hmm. even now in the middle of June. I mean, is it sopping wet? No, but it's not. It's it's much nicer. Yeah. Um, and you can see the the mycelium, this web of fungal hyphae, fungal threads that hold it all together. So it's not like something's going to catch fire and like lift off and be a flying ember. Like it's really matted together in this doesn't feel it's not moist but it's got that coolness like you know yeah, there's cool there's sand in there and it's connected yeah there's like fibers it's all adhering together, together. It's, really it's like a matrix Ooh. okay what about raised veg bed can you do the same thing so bonnie do you mean can we put the plants so for the veggie bit um normally we'd put the veggies on top of the berm yeah so we fill the, the swale with with clippings and prunings and wood chips and then the part that you dug out to make the hole of, or the indent of the swale you put mm -hmm. up and you plant yeah. in the berm so you, you can put your veggies so I don't have even veggie beds I have my veggies in her berms. all on my yeah. berms either in a keyhole which is sort of around or just in in some meanders yeah but we generally you want to avoid mixing wood chips with the soil around your veggies veggies right. are veggies are very hungry they like a lot of nitrogen and good nutrients in the soil and as wood chips are being broken down by soil organisms the soil organisms are consuming those that nitrogen. So there's a temporary deficit of available nitrogen in the soil when wood chips are being broken down right there. So keep the wood chips in the swales or on the pads or around your trees and your shrubs. And then around your veggies, you would have more of like a compost mulch, something that has um, you know, more nitrogen yeah. in it and less carbon. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, chickens. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on this one. Any cheap way to store 20,000 gallons of winter rain water for summer? But like in a tank to be reused in that way? Seems like it. it would. So check out cheap. Check out Rain Tech. It's a website where they're doing underground storage and it's not a tank. It's a lined cavity that they fill with these um, large tubes to hold to hold them open and that you can pump the water out. And it's and the tubes to be are, are um, flexible. Flexible. Yeah. So you can use them in interesting areas. We have not yet used them, right? To right. just be completely <clears throat> and they come highly recommended. I've read their yeah. website. It looks yeah. pretty we're be excited to try it out. So. Yeah, it's and they were you know they can make it any size and shape and on slopes and and things. So it's much more versatile than tanks and underground. So it doesn't require the big support um, platform. Um, so cheaper, we're thinking. But check that out, Rain Tech. Um, and I think like it's. It I mean, we'll make sure we add that to the yeah to the thing. Okay, tips on keeping chickens from scratching out the material in swales. Some they're they're very annoying, aren't they? Um, <laughs> So we haven't had much luck yet. <laughs> we've seen people put the jute fiber over the berms to keep the chickens from scratching the soil back into the swales. So that's one problem. They still scratch the wood chips onto the berms. Um, but getting the, the, the mycelium in there to where it kind of holds the wood chips together better. So, yeah. you know, honestly, it's like keep the chickens in one area for a while and then move them and don't give them unrestricted access to everything. I know that can be so challenging. <laughs> Like easier yeah. said than done, but then you can let areas kind of recover and establish um, their own sort of root and mycelial matrix, which makes it a little bit harder for the chickens to dig them up. Right. And what about though putting the jute? Like if you had just done the swale, swale and because other and anything else might not look very nice. You no, know, I'm right. all the way. I don't like cords. But then I they'll dig like the ties. soil all over the Maybe. jute. I know. We're gonna think about that one. It's yeah. a great question. I think eventually they get tired of it. Yeah. I mean, at least mine did. Um, I never did. <laughs> I don't have them anymore, but you know, I just remember for a while when it was brand new, ooh, it smelled really good and they were all over it and then oh, they lost know. interest. pg &E does recommend breaking up areas of wood chips with flagstones or other pavers. So maybe you could oh. set flagstones in your, in your swales as part of your walking surface and chickens would still get around the edges. Um, but also we've had pretty good luck with rocks as the yeah. boundary between the swales and the soil. It's not foolproof and the small ones don't really work, but there's those Sonoma um, fieldstone, headstone, you know, head size um, that look really pretty and you can make, you know, one and two layer walls, fireproof, separate your wood chips from your soil, little chicken control. Yeah. Yeah. It was just really quick on the thing of mulch. We meant to say that um, gorilla hair is just like, don't get gorilla hair. Yeah. I don't know if you all heard that already, but I'm, I'm amazed that people still ordering it right and, and, and i mean i guess and again I, there's just like different people say different things we some guy was like oh but it mats down really nicely and holds together really well it's just mega flammable and yeah flammable and it, it adds light so it carries it's so we just had wanted to just present that in case no one had heard yeah. so okay um the question was is it rain tank or rain tech so it's rain tech that's the name of the underground storage yeah and we do have that in ours resources right i'm not sure gonna yeah and I, I will be emailing everybody the resources that you send me Great. so everyone will have that list so we see bonnie you said something um hugel culture for a raised bed so just the hugel cultures in the beginning they tend to be drier because it's wood and air spaces and it's hard to like pack them tight enough that you don't have the air spaces right so um just, just keep that in mind, like put, put together your hugel culture in the fall when it's just starting to get wet so that yeah. it can get really saturated. And then- um, I think they're like winter squashes or yeah. depending on what critters you have, right? You could grow things that would grow over the winter. That would, yeah, that would, yeah, that you could grow over the winter. You could do a good cover crop. You could do yeah. all fava beans, fava beans and clover and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then that'll help it break down more. And then the next year you could, or maybe two. Yeah. Depends on what wood, it depends on what your hugel culture is made out of and what your climate is like. And yeah, but for um, for veggies, um, only they yeah, like the squashes and potatoes. And potatoes and stuff, will work, but um, a lot of them don't like the hugels. And they take it's like a th after three years, your hugel is like oh, really doing it. It's kind of settled, and the air pockets have all filled in, and it's good to go. But those first few years can be a little <clears throat> mostly dry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. 
event, it can be an eventual raised bed. Yeah. Well, this might be a good time for you to tell us about the hum. Oh, oh yeah. Hum so event. Ready to post here. Oh, do you want to put it here? I can put it up on the. Yeah, I'm not on the call well, on my computer. We can show you a little flyer. Oh, this is actually the event. It's not what I wanted. But. So this is inspired by a workshop that we went to about five years ago called Music as Medicine. And it was a combination of Joanna Macy's work that reconnects and music and permaculture. And the idea is that, um, man, we need help to like work through the grief and the, and the struggle of being humans right now. And it's hard and we need to process our, our pain. We and need to singing. do it in community. Yeah, in community and singing. And you know, I had I had the great pleasure of someone asking me, like, well, I mean, okay, I understand the work that reconnects and I've heard of permaculture, I'm pretty clear, but like what does that have anything to do with singing? Right. And so really um, the idea of singing together in community is not so different from gardening or building something in community. And mm -hmm. so many people we hear all the time, I don't sing, I don't sing, it's not for me. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Right, or I don't garden, I kill everything. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Yeah. There's this interesting a feeling of, oh, no, 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 not me. And so it, it really just brings everyone together with the idea of like, we're going to do this together. Yeah. And it's going to be beautiful. And it doesn't matter if you're in tune. It's not about being in tune, it's okay. just about being, period. Right. So um, we would love if any of you want to come on down to Santa Cruz, there's camping and there's an outdoor kitchen and it's in mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really, really, really beautiful. Yes, my friend Karen is coming. We're so Yay. excited. And there's just so many songs about loving the earth that just fill up your heart and remind you of why it's an amazing time to be a human being, even though it's a really hard time to be a human being. Yeah. Right. So if not now, it. when? And if not who? If not us, then who, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. And like Mary Oliver says, pay attention, be astonished. Tell, Tell about, about it. it. <laughs>